Marlins pitching is showing up early in spring, led by Ryan Weathers. Ryan Weathers could be an ace on 50% of Major League Baseball clubs. However, for the Marlins, he is number eight on the depth chart. How do the Marlins keep doing this time and again? This is Locked On Marlins. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked On Marlins. It's your daily Marlins pod. I'm your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up on X at Miami Marlins underscore UK. If you're listening to the pod, of course, hit subscribe. This is your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen. It's a Saturday episode. And guys, we are into March. And if you've been following along, particularly with the at Marlins account, you will know opening day is this month. You will know that Skip Schumacher... Uh, is heavily promoting opening day. The Marlins are going all in on skip puns linked to opening day. Uh, But nevertheless, the Marlins will play a regular season game this month. There is a YouTube channel as well, guys. Don't forget that. Join me over on YouTube. Of course, it's Locked on Marlins on YouTube. So join me there as well, particularly get into the comments. It's always a fun conversation there. Uh, Guys, this episode is sponsored. Yes, of course, we've got a sponsor by our good friends over at FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $150 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And guys, where are we starting today? For those that are watching, you have the rundown to help you. But let me just, for those that aren't watching and just listening along, no problem with that. Give you the rundown. Pitching is dominant early. Marlins, particularly the starting rotation candidates, have all come out and have looked sensational. Sensational, as Chris Brown would say. Um, and it's it's really encouraging. Uh, it has been led by, well, we've seen Lazardo now twice through the rotation. Uh, we're back around the cycle now. Uh, but we have seen everyone perform effectively. It was a little bit sluggish from Ryan Weathers, I think, first time out. Uh, for him, but boy, oh boy, he bounced back. There's going to be some some Ryan Weathers conversations. There's been a lot of Ryan Weathers conversations uh, as well the past couple of, like, past 24 hours, let's say, on X. Uh, and he talk about Max Meyer. He is back. Tim Anderson equally making his debut. So, listen, the, the action is thick and fast during spring training. We've got you covered here on Locked On Marlins, of course. And uh, we are starting with the pitching. Uh, this is being recorded and is going out on Saturday morning, so 2nd of March. Uh, before the Saturday game, but after Friday's game, uh, which was a Jesus Lazardo start. And boy, oh boy, just generally for the Marlins and their their rotation, it has been a glorious start to the uh the, to spring. It's often the case, right, where you know the, the the pitchers should be a little bit ahead of the hitters. It's what you generally think. <laughs> and so the, you know, your expectations should be aligned accordingly. But you just can't get away from the fact that the guys that are fighting for jobs in the rotation have all effectively showed out really effectively thus far. So that's a really encouraging sign. The bullpen is a different situation, and there's a lot of guys that are fighting for jobs in the pen um, that have looked less encouraging. Even Tanner Scott made his season debut a few days back, and it was a putrid one. So you know, maybe we'll talk about Tanner Scott later in this episode if we have time, because I did want to touch on that briefly. Uh, the volatility of relievers is real, no doubt. Uh, but from a starting perspective, um, you know, it's been really encouraging. Two times we've seen Ryan Weathers, two times we've seen Jesus Lozado. And, you know, what we haven't seen thus far has been Trevor Rogers. What we haven't seen thus far has been Braxton Garrett. Uh, and we haven't seen Sixto Sanchez, for those that are still tracking Sixto. So there's a few guys that are a bit behind. Braxton Garrett, again, Let's just briefly touch on Brax. I mentioned this, I think, at the time when you know the injury was noted around, oh, I'm, I'm a touch behind, I'm just having a rest day. I never believe one thing that the Marlins say linked to injuries, and particularly the ones where it says this is day-to-day linked to a pitcher. But to be honest with you, it could be any, you know, any position, to be honest with you. History told me in 2023 that you should not trust one thing that the Marlins say regarding injuries. 
And unfortunately, I think with Braxton Garrett, you know, this is probably more serious than it was portrayed. Surprise, surprise. And, you know, Brax definitely, like, he, I'd say he's definitely missing opening day and, you know, first time through the rotation. The question is going to be at this point is how many weeks, how many times through the rotation does Braxton Garrett miss? So already with Sandy Alcantara down, that's one fifth of your rotation. You then have Braxton Garrett. It's probably two fifths of your rotation that's going to be missing. So already depth is being tested. And this goes back to the conversations that we've had through this offseason with the Marlins looking to trade from pitching depth. And they do have pitching depth if everyone is healthy. However, that isn't how baseball is played. A regular season is not played with everyone healthy. We've already got two fifths of the, the rotation missing for opening day. That's 40% for those that need the simple maths there on that one. But that's 40% of your rotation already missing. Trevor Rogers could be penciled in there in the rotation. We haven't seen Trevor. He's behind as well. So is that 60% of your rotation that would be missing from the opening day roster and through the first time through the order? It could be. And so this just talks to it, right? You always need depth. You need at least 10 starters, to be honest with you, to get through a season. So. Like I mentioned, when there's talk about trading from that depth, really, that's it's it's a worry. And it leaves the Marlins exposed. You take from one area that you need to help another area that you need. But this is it, it all comes back to it. Free agency. You have the opportunity to add sticks in free agency. And let me just briefly touch on free agency as well. There, you know, there is talented major league level dudes, particularly hitters that are having to take minor league deals at that point. That's what the market is looking like. I saw something, I think it was the Spotrack projected opening day roster, so it doesn't account for league minimum dudes. But I think the Marlins were, I want to say, bottom five in that, somewhere in that range, maybe bottom six. But the funny thing was, is like, actually, they were, I think they were fifth bottom. The Rays, the Marlins, the Reds, the Indians, I think, were in that cluster, plus the Nats and, and the A's. I haven't got in front of I should have had in front of me, but I've got off onto a segue that I didn't expect. You know, standard locked on Marlins, right? But the interesting part there, and this is why it pertains to free agency, is it, it wouldn't shock me. I mean, the most shocking would be if the Marlins won the division, but it is not totally out of the equation that four of those six clubs were to win their division or at least make the postseason. And this is kind of the, the, the change in the game now where you're getting clubs prioritizing, you know, young talent, toolsy dudes, to toolsy dudes and league minimum. And this is leaving those like fringe vets exposed. Like their market is shrinking. The clubs like the Marlins, the Rays, the, the, the Guardians. Uh, did I say the Indians first time? I might have done. Um, you know, these clubs you know, they're, they're not looking at big ticket free agents or even mid ticket free agents. And so that market is absolutely cratering. It's a huge concern for the players that, you know, effectively are under club control for all of this time. They come out of the back end of that, you know, towards their age 30 season and they have no market. And okay, I get it. They, they, their future is in their hands in some ways, but you know, that's just the direction we're seeing in this off season. Anyway, clearly, generational talents, it's maybe a different situation. And like elite dudes, you're still getting paid, but even those aren't getting paid to the 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 type of length and value of guaranteed money that we've seen historically. So I think it's a really interesting free agent market. It's a really interesting free agent shift. And it comes down to, uh, how, am I, how am I tying this back to the Marlins? Pete, where are you going with this point? The point I'm making is you don't need to go and trade Edward Cabrera for a, a shortstop, you could just sign for under five million or under multiple dudes that would perfectly do the job, probably as well or as good as or better than maybe we'll see what Tim Anderson could do um, than what you trade for. I get it, you have the club control with the trade situation, but anyway, the Marlins have a ton of pitching depth, but it is already being tested. Sandy, Brax, Trevor. Six, though, the four of them, they're not. I don't think any of those four will be on 
the will, will be on the roster um, come opening day. So you're already tested. It's then who can step up. I'm going to talk about Ryan Weathers. I want to talk about Max Meyer. I also want to talk about Tim Anderson and his debut as well. Before we do that, uh, it's time to let you know about our good friends over at FanDuel. Yes, sir. And we'll get the graphics pumped for those that are watching. Uh, FanDuel, you can get your buckets and get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks if your bet wins. Uh, you can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, guys, back here with me, Peter Pratt, on Saturday, the 2nd of March. Yes, a weekend episode. It's how I like it. It's how I like it. Hope you guys do uh, as well. So, pitch in depth being tested, but the guys that are there are showing out. Let's talk about Ryan Weathers. Uh, I need to talk about Ryan Weathers primarily because uh, everyone's talking about Ryan Weathers seemingly <laughs> um, in uh, on, on X right now. Uh, I... Uh, Let's start with why we're talking about him and why I'm excited about him. So the game, the Marlins played the Yankees a few days ago. It was a late game for UK standards, but it was televised. So that was great. I didn't watch it live as per my usual kind of approach. Uh, and so I was then greeted in the morning with Ryan Weathers' information and statistics to hand. Let's start with the top level number for Ryan Weathers. And I want to dig into something else as well. But from Ryan Weathers' perspective, his, his second start uh, for the Marlins this spring, he ends up going two and two-thirds. He threw 48 pitches, 30 of them for strikes. He, let, he gave up one single hit. He walked one dude, and he struck out five. So he went through the lineup uh, just over one complete turn, one complete rotation of the lineup. The lineup he was facing was the New York Yankees in this game. The Yankees lineup at this point, the starter was facing. Let me just go through them. Let's just legitimize this start here um, from Ryan Weathers. DJ LeMahieu, Gleyber Torres, Tony Rizzo, Big G, Alex Verdugo, Anthony Volpe, Trent Grisham, Gonzalez, don't know who that is, and Rort Vett, don't know who that is, but he's the catcher. So I don't know who Gonzalez is. Let's just, it's O Gonzalez. Let's assume it's Oscar Gonzalez. And uh, I have no idea who he is. Anyway, the seven dudes ahead of that, legit dudes, that could legitimately be uh, the Yankees, you know, apart from Soto, I guess, the Yankees lineup. So it was a legit lineup that Ryan Weathers was facing. He, um, like I said, struck out five, one walk, gave up one hit, two and two thirds uh, in just under 50 pitches. Really encouraging from Ryan Weathers. And the thing was as well, it looked very different from his first start. And the thing that popped, that really popped, was the velo was way up, it felt like, for Ryan Weathers. And this is what got me excited. Where I was looking, he was he was touching 99. Two pitches were over 98 miles an hour. One of them, 98.7 miles an hour. When I saw this, and I saw that statistic specifically. I <laughs> this is going to be quite a specific quote, so you might need to go and check this out. I made a noise, like I read that, and I made the type of noise that <laughs> I've only heard in a notorious BIG track. That track is I Love the Dough. So if you're wondering what noise I've made right now, pause this, go and open up Apple Music or wherever. Find I Love the Dough by Notorious B.I.G. And in the intro of that song, probably like 25 to 30 seconds in, where they're doing like a dice game, there is a high-pitched noise from the guy. That's the that's literally the noise I gave out when I read that Ryan Weathers was touching 99 against the Yankees and blowing these dudes away. All right. Why am I hyped about Ryan Weathers? And, okay, let's just call it out, by the way. There's, a, there's plenty of hyperbole on X in the me saying that Ryan Weathers would likely be the ace 
of the staff on 50% of major league teams. Instead, he's the number eight guy in the rotation for the Marlins. No idea how the Marlins keep doing this. It was a standard Pete Pratt tweet. Of course, um, I don't truly believe that, uh, that he is an ace at this point. But with that being said, Ryan Weathers and Jesus Lazardo have very similar backgrounds in many ways. And what we've seen from Jesus Lazardo is exactly what the Marlins script could look like for Ryan Weathers. You end up trading for, and listen, to get Weathers, the Marlins didn't have to give up you know, really anything, uh, to be honest with you. If we think about the Jesus Lazardo situation, that was to move Starling Marte. And that felt that was painful at the time, to be honest with you. The Marlins managed to get Jesus Lazardo back from half a season of Starling Marte. The Marlins moved Garrett Cooper half a season of Coop, uh, who actually did pretty well in San Diego, um, to get Ryan Weathers. <laughs> Ryan Weathers, a high draft pick for the for the Padres, um, was asked, and I've looked at this before, he was asked to you know, step up to the big league level pretty early and maybe a touch too soon. I, I sense that probably things with the Padres, he's just been a little bit mismanaged and things then went a bit sideways and the pressure built, etc. Nevertheless, it sounds kind of familiar with, with Jesus Lozado. Both lefties and both of them, as they were traded uh, and as they then made their Marlins debuts, both pretty much underwhelmed. You look at both uh, Savant pages from 2021 for Lozado and 2023 from Weathers. They're both not having good years. What happened to Jesus Lozado the next year? He had his first offseason, full offseason within the Marlins organization. Next thing is, he rolls into spring and looks transformed. And all of a sudden, Ryan Weathers, in particularly in, in one start against a loaded Yankees lineup, looks legit. He looks legit. And so the Marlins have a history of doing this. This isn't and won't be a fluke situation where they've managed to trade for a left-handed former top prospect that it isn't working out in that in that organization, bring them into their organization and make a few minor tweaks. And next thing is, you now, a couple of years on, have Jesus Lozado as your opening day starter for the Marlins. That can happen. There's no reason why that can't happen for Ryan Weathers. And at that point, maybe he would be the ace of the staff on 50% of major league clubs. I don't know. Would Jesus Lozado be the number one on 50% of clubs right now? Maybe. Maybe he would be. I don't know. I haven't looked into any depth. But, I mean, there's there's probably 10 teams that are bang average and below average in terms of their, their top of the rotation. So, you know, and there's maybe a few more that it's a coin flip. But that's, that's the art of what's possible here for the Marlins. They have form. They've traded for guys and they've sprinkled on the magic dust and they've they've been able to unlock something. What's to say that can't happen with, with Ryan Weathers? We think back to what the A's fans were saying at the time. He's terrible. He's rubbish. He can't be fixed. We're done with the Jesus Lozado. All of us Marlins fans saw it for what it... I mean, you go back and look at that trade and the reaction of the Marlins fans. It was all hyper-positive at the time. Oh my God, we got Jesus Lozado for, for half a year rental of, of Starling Marte. Boy, this feels like a win. That was the feeling. It's fair to say that Ryan Weathers didn't come with the same hype, I would say, post-trade. But, but, if Ryan Weathers can get himself into a situation where he can be a four or five for the Marlins, pumping 99 gasolina, then that's still a huge fat dub for the Marlins in trading away Garrett Cooper, a rental Garrett Cooper. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited about Ryan Weathers. I've been talking about him a lot because I've seen this before. I've seen this play out before, exactly this. And maybe Weathers won't get to the level of Lozado, where he's an opening day starter, a one, a two, a three. But even if he's a three, four, five, bottom of the rotation dude that's reliable and has sexy hair, then I'm all in. I'm all in for that. And that's it's exactly the type of dudes that the Marlins need, to be honest with you. You know, because for the exact reasons I've already mentioned, Sandy's down, Brax is struggling, Trevor's struggling. You need Ryan Weathers. Ryan Weathers are the guys that you turn to. 
and you need someone like Max Meyer as well. We're going to talk about him uh, very shortly as well. But please, please, just to bring it to life, go and listen to I Love the Dough by Biggie. The early intro, 20, 25 seconds in, whatever it is, where the guy lets out a, a vocal. <laughs> that was exactly mine when I read that rhyme weather situation. Let's talk about Max Meyer. So Max Meyer, different situation. Uh, I've talked about Max Meyer in a couple of weeks back, comparing him to Spencer Strider. It's a bold claim. It's a bold comp, but their histories are aligned. And there's, you know, there's no reason really why Max Meyer can't, you know, the ceiling of Max Meyer is Spencer Strider. And right now, the way people are looking at Spencer Strider in, in, in Major League Baseball is he could be, he maybe is the best pitcher in baseball at this moment. From a fantasy perspective, that's absolutely where a lot of people uh, are at at this point, particularly after Garrett Cole just got, he just got demolished by Big Dan. Big Dan Vogelback taking Garrett Cole deep. <laughs> that wouldn't happen to Spencer Strider. Yeah, it probably would, to be fair. Um, but go and have a look at Max Meyer's career. Go and have a look at Spencer Strider's career. Drafted same years. Meyer outperformed Strider in all of the years, in all of the levels. Meyer then gets hurt. Strider kicks on. The rest is history. But Max Meyer made his debut for the Marlins. First time pitching in a game since June of 22. I think that's right. June of 22 was the last time. So it's been a long time for Max Meyer. Long road back. Let me just briefly mention something about Max Meyer at this point. Craig Mish, who we all go to and we lean on. He's the Marlins reporter goat. He's the goat. He's the goat. Craig has, you know, put a few comments out there regarding Max Meyer around, I'm very interested about this dude. I'm watching this guy closely. Those types of comments. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. Does it mean Max could be good? He could be really, like, does Craig think that Max Meyer is really good? Does he think he could be a stud? Or does he think he won't be? I don't know. Someone asked Craig that. I, I don't know what that means. It's talking, it's talking in, in riddles here, but he's closely watching Max Meyer. So am I. So am I. I think what he's saying is Max Meyer is determined to do well and Craig thinks he can. I think that's what he's saying. Anyway, Max Meyer comes out and makes his, uh, his spring debut uh, for the Marlins against the Yankees as well. This, this game finished nil-nil, by the way. Zero-zero. This is like, you know, a mid-table scrap in the Premier League. Nil-nil. But it was all about the Marlins pitching, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there's actually a few standouts in there as well. I mean, I'm not talking about a lot about Weathers. I'm going to talk about a lot about Maya shortly. But Brian Hoeing as well had a really nice outing. Uh, Tony Bender had a nice outing. So, you know, there was a lot of you know good standouts here. But Max Meyer, two innings, gave up a single hit, two Ks. He ends up throwing 31 pitches on debut, 20 of them for strikes. So for Max Meyer, a near... Perfect return. What did we see from Max Meyer? We saw the fastball. We saw the slider. We saw, I think, a changeup sprinkled in there like relatively infrequently. This is the funny thing. This is why I'm talking about Spencer Strider. Strider's effectively been and ascended to one of the best pitchers in the game as a two-pitch guy. And then why everyone's very hyped this offseason is he's all of a sudden demonstrating a changeup and a curveball seemingly. So Strider's taking the next step. But what that shows is even as a two-pitch guy, if you if if those two pitches are elite, you can still be really effective as a starter. But to get to the next level, to get to the next level, which effectively Strider was talking about, you know, upper echelons here, you need that third, that fourth pitch. You need Eddie Cabrera's arsenal, <laughs> to be honest. You need Eddie Cabrera's arsenal without the walks. Um, Eddie Cabrera, by the way, I mean, I haven't spoken about him. Talk about him in another episode. We haven't got time. Um, so Max Meyer out there just doing his thing. And boy, oh boy, listen, Max, considering he's thrown his, his first appearance of the season, two innings and 31 pitches, that's exactly the range that all the guys that are being stretched out, all the potential starters are throwing. So Max Meyer at this point, I know I've spoken about it. He may end up, end up in the pen to start the year. He may end up a triple A, whatever it may look like. 
Max Meyer through spring is going to be managed and built up as a starter. Really excited about that. Really excited about that for Max Meyer. Craig's watching it closely. <laughs> Whatever that may mean. Um, so am I. Everyone's watching it closely. It's going to be fun. But a perfect performance and a perfect debut for Max Meyer. Um, you know, we'll see if he actually slots into a rotation slot or they just, you know, there's really no need. You can kind of piggyback guys maybe this early and, you know, he's maybe a, a start behind everyone else. But, you know, this is is super encouraging for Max, super encouraging for Weathers. And frankly, the way, you know, already with Brax, with Trevor trailing behind, there's no reason why Max Meyer can't make the rotation opening day. It feels like AJ Puck kind of has the lead on that at that point. And that's fine. AJ Puck equally looked really, really interesting uh, and a little bit more complete as a starter in some ways because he was definitely out there um, throwing that those secondary pitches a little bit more than Max Meyer. I think Max Meyer still just focused on, you know, do what I do best. Do what I do best. That's throw that fastball, but really work that slider in there and get strikeouts on that slider. Like that's, that's his bread and butter. So it makes sense to ease himself back in on that front. But Max Meyer... He is in touching distance of the Marlins opening day rotation. I'm watching him closely. Another guy we're watching very, very closely is Tim Anderson. He finally made his Marlins debut. And there were, and this is off the back of, by the way, go and have a listen to the recent podcast from Fit the Fish on First Guys. Primarily it was hosted by Eli, but equally, I think Danny Rodriguez was on that one as well. Um, with, a, with a guy, and I forget his name, like top of my head. I want to say Mark. Um, but effectively talking about the methodologies behind um, the, the the defensive stats, and uh, it was it was eye opening in some ways. It was very intriguing as well. Uh, as well, it was a great episode. I'd really encourage you to to listen to that one. But they spoke about Tim Anderson in some depth for obvious reasons because you know we we've, we've seen Tim Anderson's bat go backwards, but at the same time. What's kind of flying under the radar a touch is what about his glove? And boy, oh boy, it was not a good assessment of Tim Anderson defensively. And it then got me thinking, I was like, man, like, I know we talked about Wendell not being great, but what he was was solid defensively. And if Tim Anderson rolls in here and is absolutely the reverse of solid defensively, no matter what his stick does, the Marlins have probably taken a step back because we've already talked about this. This club is pitching in defense. Tim Anderson almost has to be seen as a glove first guy. He has to be. That's how the Marlins looked at it last year. I know he struggled with the stick, but the Marlins were happy to carry the stick because the offense, you know, wasn't as important. The defense was. And if Tim Anderson's glove doesn't work, then that's a big problem for Tim Anderson. Big problem. They talked about what happens if he transitioned to second base. That's not that's not happening with the Marlins because they've got about 19 second basemen. So it's shortstop or bust, or the DH spot maybe, particularly if the stick comes alive. But yeah, I look at this with Tim Anderson. For me, yeah, I know we're interested in the stick, and the stick, you know, in his debut didn't show out at all. I think it was over two with two Ks. But defensively, we had a flashy play, which was nice to see. And so for me, I'm watching closely Tim Anderson's defense. The defense has to play. If the defense doesn't play, then I don't think Tim Anderson's going to play. To be honest, I don't I don't see any other role for him. He has to be at least good at shortstop because everything for this Marlins to be, you know, successful hinges on their pitching, which hinges on their defense. You've already got Jake Berger there at third. You've added in Tim Anderson. It's the White Sox left side of the infield. We saw what happened to the White Sox last year. Wasn't good. Can Berger and Tim Anderson combine to shore up that side? It's going to hinge on Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson's glove has to play. If the stick plays as well, it's a bonus. But the glove has to play. If it doesn't, Tim Anderson will be gone. He won't even last out this, this contract. He won't even make it to the deadline if his glove is putrid. It won't. It, and he won't be given a ton of time. If it's if it's like it was last year then I don't think Tim Anderson makes it to the deadline. Hot take, I know, but the glove has to play. And if it doesn't, the Marlins have got a big, big problem. We're going to call it a day there, guys. Uh, as you can sense, I'm very excited about the pitching. The rotation is shaping up nicely. The guys that are healthy look to be settling in well and pitching well. 
the Marlins are going to need to rely heavily on guys like Ryan Weathers and Max Meyer. We were already seeing the challenges, the health challenges that will exist for the Marlins, but equally they will exist for every club. Every club. The success of the Marlins will hinge on the health and the depth of their rotation. And Tim Anderson at shortstop. Thanks for making Lockdown Marlins your first listen of the day, guys. I'm going to be back probably over the weekend again for another weekend episode. And of course, back next week, we're on full go here through through spring and building up to opening day. Yes, it is opening day this month. Look forward to seeing you soon.